Good morning, everybody. It is indeed my privilege to chair a session for a renowned speaker, Dr. Banerjee. At present, uh, he is Homi Bhabha Chair Professor in BRC. He is also Chancellor of Homi Bhabha National Institute, the university. And uh, he is a renowned material scientist of our country. The remarkable feature about him is he does a lot of fundamental science and publish more than 500 papers, but uh, that is on one hand. But he has developed so many technologies, zircali pressure tubes, shape memory alloys, use of metallic fuel in FBRs, and many, many. So such a combination of fundamental science and utility to the society, uh, such a great balance there are very, very few parallels in our country. And therefore, I said I'm, I'm privileged. He's a man of action, excellent orator, and uh, he has uh, firm beliefs about which I think I'm a, all of us should think and take action in, the, in those directions. So with this brief introduction, I request Dr. Shri Kumar Banerjee to give his preliminary lecture. So thank you, Chairman, for your kind words and uh, good morning to all of you. You know, talking on the last day of a seminar has some challenges and also has some advantages. Challenges are that, that whatever you plan to speak when you are preparing your talk, you'll find many of that has already been covered. And the advantage is that you are rich by the wisdom gained during these sessions when you have sat for other lectures. So you have to do last minute modifications, which I did, and I start like that. There are questions, different questions arise, and these questions are not just which arose during our discussion. It came all along because thorium has been there for many years. So first question that comes, from general people, particularly our friends from the media, and a very important one of them is sitting in front, is that nuclear power from thorium is being talked about for nearly 60 years, a little over 60 years. Why it is taking so long for it to come into existence in, in real commercial terms? Is there any fundamental advantage of thorium in thorium fuel cycle? Is thorium breeding possible, I mean, in thermal breeding possible in thorium? Does thorium fuel cycle offer any solution to the long-lived radioactive waste? Is closed fuel cycle essential for thorium utilization? What are the previous experiences in generating an energy from thorium? What are the different options for use of thorium? Does these options vary with different scenarios prevailing in different countries? It's not a same solution, no panacea. What fuel cycles need to be deployed under different scenarios? Is it possible to use thorium in existing reactor systems? And what are the best type of reactors? And what is the role of accelerator driven subcritical system in using thorium? In fact, if I give a summary, if you see that all that we have discussed over the last three days are answering some of the questions. So again, I'll try to do answering some of the questions in not exactly in the same order. It's not like question answer session. So you see that whether you find some answers of these questions in my presentation. These are all repeated. So very quickly I'll go through the issues like this, that it has a, yes, very high abundance, three to four times that of uranium, higher melting point of thorium oxide, better thermal conductivity, lower fission gas release, good radiation resistance on dimensional stability, reduced fuel deterioration in the event of failure, and all these have been illustrated as you have seen in the previous presentations. Relative ease in waste management. This also has been highlighted, and there are more papers, even mine, when you get this information further. This is a very stable oxide. See, there are two fundamental points in thorium. Thorium gives you U-233, the lowest mass number fissile element. 
That's one point. It's U233. So it doesn't go to the transuranic to a very large number, which are very long lived. So that's one point. And stable, very stable oxide, or that is, that is monovalent material. Thorium is monovalent, uranium is not. And being monovalent, thorium oxide is a very stable. Thorium oxide does not have much of defects, which allows diffusion. So all that are advantages purely coming from these two facts. Neutronic characteristics, thermal capture cross-section for the two fertile materials, thorium-232 and uranium-238, if you compare, you will find that the thermal capture cross-section for thorium is much more. So as a, an effective fertile material, this is much better. No doubt about that. And another fundamental point is the number of neutrons that are coming out after every fission. That factor is eta. And that you see for the case of thorium, the blue line, you have it slightly above 2, but consistently in the whole range from the thermal to the epithermal, only when it crosses nearly about 50 kV or near 1 MeV, the plutonium-239 crosses over, and that gives the advantage at 1 MeV. So in the first neutron spectrum, the number of neutrons that come out from the fission process for plutonium-239 is larger than that of uranium-233. So these are the fundamental points. And so one can assume that we can easily see that thorium can be a very good burnable poison. If you start, yeah, the other point which has also come up very nicely in many other presentations earlier, the thorium does not, natural thorium, do not have any fissile constituent in it. So you have to insert some fissile to start with. You have to trigger it. So thorium initially acts as a burnable poison, and later U233 formation occurs, and that then becomes a feasible poison. Feasible. See the spelling. So neutronic characteristics of fissile nucleus, if I look at uranium-233, 235, and plutonium-239, there is again a substantial variation, and it's in favor of 233. But this is for the thermal spectrum. In thermal spectrum, you see that the ratio of fission and capture cross-section is much larger in 233, a great advantage for that. So these are some fundamental points which cannot be debated. These are all well-established scientific facts. The next important point comes from the waste. If you use a uranium-235 plutonium fuel cycle, then the radioactivity or radiotoxicity of the waste comes down like this, and look at this decay time in years. This is million years. So even beyond million years, they, the radioactive decay process is not complete to come to the level of the natural uranium ore. Whereas if you're working purely on uranium-233 thorium fuel cycle, then it can come down in a couple of hundred years. So there's a large difference. Orders of magnitude difference in years, this question came up. You can look at the numbers, and it's clear. The neptunium production, americium production, or curium, it is 900 in this fuel cycle, 235, 238 fuel cycle. Whereas in case of 233, uranium and th thorium-232, it is as low as 3. So substantially reduce production of these large, the, these minor actinides, which has a very long uh, radioactive life. So these are very fundamental points. Main difficulty is this. Who is providing you this U-233? Thorium-232 is available. You need uranium-233. To get that, what is missing? What is missing is neutron. So whenever we talk of resources in nuclear energy, we must remember there are two resources. One is feasible, that is fissionable nucleides that is required. And the second thing that is required is neutrons. Without the neutron, you cannot do it. So the neutron, you need one extra because before fission, you have to convert that thorium-232 to uranium-233. So that is why the issue comes and why is, so the delay I'll come to the point later. So what's the technological difficulty? One major technological difficulty is that production of this U-232 and protactinium-231, that finally gives you the 232 uranium, which has some daughter products which have a long life, particularly bismuth-220 and thorium thallium-28 emit strong gamma rays. Some people say it's an advantage because uranium, this U-233 contaminated U-233 will always be emitting gamma, so it cannot be diverted for the use of weapons. There are a number of examples of previous experience. See, this is one point which is not driven home, though people have done it, but I think I am trying to drive it even stronger way, that this is not something like an experimental thing. There's an if and but kind of a situation. Thorium has been used. Thorium has been used very effectively. 
So there's no question, it's not a technology which is unproven technology. Only just to see the number, you have molten salt reactor worked for about five years. This is not the period when it worked later one, that is 65 to 69. And we had in the range of two to eight megawatt. We had shipping port, 60 to 100 megawatt electric. We had high temperature reactor in thorium and enriched uranium USA running about 330 megawatt electric. The thorium high temperature reactor in Germany and in coming in a very modest way, we had also operated and we have been operating at 30 kilowatt level. So it's not something like a fusion research. It's not something like something which is in the science fiction. It is a reality. Coming to the light water breeder reactor, very interesting concept because they wanted to really control the reactivity by, by very movement of seed and seed, seed and that to minimize this parasitic capture by the control rods. Whenever you are talking of thorium utilization, the most important part comes is that you have to be more sensitive towards neutron utilization or neutron economy. And that is why it is done that way. The process is like this. You move the seed and control the reactor. And it has worked, worked between 77 to 82, produced 2.5 billion kilowatt hour of energy. Please note that. And it has demonstrated that 1.39% more for fissile material was produced. So a breeding ratio of 1.0139 has been achieved. So there has been a successful breeding process in a thorium-based reactor way back between 77 to 82. Our Kamini, a very small reactor, which is being used for neutron radiography and neutron activation analysis. We have been running it from 96 till today. Now these points that one day nuclear energy will be able to provide a sustainable energy form for the humanity for not centuries, for millennia. This was viewed by many people. Here I give the example. I'm not just saying they are the only two. Value breeder concept W.B. Lewis in Canada introduced. He was a good friend of Homi Bhabha. They started their friendship when they were in Cavendish lab. And afterwards, uh, Lewis was invited to Canada to lead their nuclear energy program. They were, you can see, they were born just one in 1908 and one is 1909. They had a very extended friendship. And all of them, all these sort of giants in nuclear energy, had dreamt that one day the energy problem of the world will be sorted out. And that is by fission energy alone. And this fission energy alone, if they have to use, you have to exploit all the fissile that we have in the earth and all the fertile. If you only consider the fissile part, it will stand for some years, maybe a century, not beyond. So the question that comes that to have it running for the, for the humanity, for millennium, it is required that we must go for a closed fuel cycle and make use of the fertile material as much as that of the fissile. So value breeder concept is very interesting. They wanted to optimize the initial fissile inventory so that the discharge burn up of uranium and thorium are different, but finally to maximize the fissile worth. Worth in terms of dollar. Actually, value breeder, you see it's, a, it's not a VLAUE. The UE is missing because this is a kind of a patented word. By, by Lewis. You know that Alvin Weinberg was uh, so deeply engrossed and uh, contributed so big way in the molten salt reactor development. He ran that between 65 to 69 at 8 megawatt level, and he has tried all the three fissile nucleates. Single fluid MSBR with a breeding ratio of 1.04, and a two fluid MSBR with 1,000 megawatt electric design with a breeding ratio of 1.07 using thorium fuel. Again, these designs have been there, complete. So these are not, we are not talking of something which has never happened. Then why is this delay? My friend, Mr. Pallav Bagla, a very famous journalist of the country, he is looking at me very intensely, I see. Now the, he will ask this question. Then why all this? You are saying good things about it. Why it is not there? It is not there because of this. As long as uranium is available easily for most of the countries, not for India, you don't care what is a, what's there in uh, thorium, what's there in uranium-238. You just run it once through and it's enough. So one is this. Second point is commercial success of light water reactors and the PHWRs. It makes money. So why do you need to go for anything more? Satisfy with that. So the commercial success of this, build more and more of these. And then, this is very important. The shift of emphasis from technology development to utility management. 
Utility management gives you money, gives you employment, so many things. So bother, don't bother about this technology development. And expectation that there's a competition between fast breeder reactor and say, let us take molten salt reactor. In that competition, if you just look at that eta plot at one MeV uh, energy of neutrons, obviously plutonium-239 scores better. And that shows that fast breeder reactors offers a better promise to have a much better breeding. I will come back to this point later, but this is definitely so for the fast breeder reactor, for the fast neutron spectrum. And this is another very important point, which has a political bearing as well. There's an aversion, worldwide aversion towards closed full cycle or reprocessing. Don't do reprocessing. So if you say that don't do reprocessing, none of this question of using, using fertile material will be possible. Using, unless you do reprocessing, unless you close the fuel cycle, there is no question of using any fertile material in a significant manner. Something can be done marginally. So deploying thorium energy is different approaches. One approach is that it's a very important approach. That even today, you can put thorium. You can put thorium in light water reactor, in heavy water reactor, and very effectively, without any problem. But the question is, that why should you do it? If uranium is available, why should you do it? Unless you think of the future. If you think of the future, if you want to really build up a uranium-233 inventory for solving the energy problem of the future, then we need it. But who bothers about the future? Thorium in fast reactors can be used, not so effectively. I'll explain to that. Thorium as a fuel in molten salt reactor. And thorium in accelerator-driven subcritical reactors, I don't have to elaborate. You have heard many of these in the last few days. Use of thorium in PHWRs. PHWR has a great advantage of... Uh, of mixing and uh, doing various things. You can do it in core level, serum blanket type of thing. Some regions, some of, the, some of the pressure tubes you fill up with purely thoria bundles. Channel level, in a single channel, you can have a mix of different types of fuels in some bundles are pure thoria bundles, some bundles are uh, maybe urania bundles. In bundle level, in like this, you can do that. First three layers are all uh, you can have this fissile enriched uranium or plutonium in some pins, and that may be the outer pins, and inside you can have some thoria pins. Or you can have uniformly mixed in pin level. So mixing can also be done in, in different levels. That's the advantage. So uh, my friend uh, Hari Prakash Gupta, who is also an author of this paper, uh, he has done quite a bit of calculations to see that what are the possibilities. Is there any advantage? Advantage in terms of if you use some, mix with some thoria, you have an advantage, you can reduce this uranium consumption. So for a country like India, that's also important. But there are other, there are some prices to be paid for that. Then high burn up, the main point in thorium, which again Dr. Sina in the first lecture mentioned, that unless you go to high burn up, you don't get that advantage. But you get that high burn up because what happens, the initial fissile, that is uranium-235 dies down, and uranium-233 builds up. And in this process, you can actually go to very high burn-up. And if you can reach this high, very high burn-up, obviously you need many design changes, particularly in the, in the cladding material change, cladding thickness change, and such things. But it is not impossible. And if you can go to this high burn-up, there's an annual savings. But you don't have that much of advantage in many other ways. You, you see this number, 30 years of operation. In fact, in today's presentation, I'm all taking in one uh, uh, gigawatt electric kind of a production. That's the standard for everything I'm taking like that. So if you do that, 30 years of operation will only give you six tons of U-233. It's not a tremendous advantage in this particular configuration. But for getting expertise in th for thorium technology in initial flux flattening, we have been putting thorium bundles in Indian PHWRs, and that has generated a huge amount of data. One more variation. Again in PHWR, where we are putting 3% 233 with thorium is the inner three rings to reduce the U233 requirement, and 1%, 5% plutonium with thorium is put in the outermost ring. Look at the, 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 the balance sheet. Uranium 233 remains more or less self sustaining. Whatever is a uranium 233 being generated and being consumed, it is self sustaining, and plutonium is being burnt out. So a system like this is a very good plutonium burner. And it's possible that you have a bundle of a PHWR fuel, outer ring is having plutonium and that's being continuously being burnt out, and inside material, those 
out of 36, uh, 37 pins, 19 pins are basically not burning because it has a steady supply of U233, which is being in situ bred. So that's possible. And it's a very good plutonium burner. And there are issues like that in many countries where there's an excess fissile available, both from uh, weapon as well as from the spent fuel of the previous generation reactors. Targeting still larger saving of uranium, another calculation was done. That imagine that we have one gigawatt electric year production requires about 170 tons of natural uranium. We are always comparing the natural uranium content because there's no point comparing after it has got enriched. So let us see that in that sense, 170 tons. And in the first cycle, if you put 2.4% enriched uranium-235 in thorium, and you can reach a 32,000 uh, megawatt day per ton the first cycle, subsequent cycle, you can keep on adding something, and that addition is given here. So fissile topping, we are calling it. You can have just one gram per kg of heavy metal, up to seven gram. And what you can see is that if you are reducing it to the minimum, that is only one gram per kg of heavy metal, you get a very much reduced annual requirement of uranium, it comes down to from 170 ton to 23 tons. This much is a reduction. Unfortunately, the burn up here is also very low. So not a very good solution. So to try out these various things. So Indian reactors, we have actually done many cases, the irradiation in PHWS, these bundles are irradiated, and in irradiation research reactors also, the statistics is here. This picture also has been shown earlier that basically the thoria being a more conducting material, the temperature gradient from the center to the surface is lower compared to that in urania plutonia. In urania plutonia, there's a large scale migration of uranium and plutonium along this radius of the fuel pin, and also you have the, 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 the fission gas release can attack the zircaloic tube, and you can have actually the stress corrosion cracking of the zircaloic tube here because of iodine. That problem does not happen. Here also you have a failure, but it does not, it does not lead to the clad failure because it doesn't allow that, that much of fission gases to get released to this environment outside. That's also clearly seen here. When it comes to uranium fuel, you find that the fission gases come out and they produce these kind of channels. You see also the kind of bubbles on the grain boundary surfaces. In case of thoria bundles, that doesn't happen because of the same reason that thoria can contain these fission gases much more effectively, the diffusivity of, the, of these fission gases through thoria is much, much slower. And you don't form that kind of channels. Advanced heavy water reactor has been discussed to you a number of times. You know all these issues that it has a large share power from thorium in the equilibrium core, 66% of the power will come from thorium. So there are two different configurations. It can actually accept uranium plutonium MOX, it can accept thorium plutonium MOX, you can accept uranium-233 thorium MOX in the full core. And these are the two configurations. This is the case of thorium-uranium-233 MOX with plutonium-thorium in the outer periphery. In the low enriched uranium situation, you have the three rings of three different uh, levels of LEU, uh, the, low, uh, the uranium oxide with low enrichment. The typical enrichment value is about 18 to 19%. And the volume fraction of UO2 compared to the other is about 18 to 22%. This also has the same character, that you have the reduction of the uranium-235, building up of the uter-33, and the total fissile content comes like this and essentially saturates. It remains steady there. So it is possible to gain a sub... But again, you find that unless you go across something like 40,000 megawatt day per ton, or 40, these 4 gigawatt day per ton, it is not really very useful. Use of thorium in fast reactors. Obviously, this is a point which came up in the discussion in the, in the few presentation. Breeding ratio not much affected with thorium in the blanket. In blanket, if you put, there's no problem. But there's a substantial reduction in the breeding ratio if thorium is placed inside the core. It's about 17%. And the breeding ratio of 233 thorium cycle in fast reactor is much smaller to that of plutonium 238. This is due to two factors. One is the low eta of U233 and low the fission cross-section of thorium, which is indicated here. So these are established physics facts. There's no debate or doubts on these. Now, advantage of uranium-233 thorium cycle in fast reactor safety is important. One is the reduction in the sodium void coefficient. And second, the Doppler coefficient of reactivity, 
will be more negative for thorium, uranium-233 thorium cycle compared to this cycle. And this will improve the safety of the reactor. Now coming to the concept, you know, there are immediately there are concepts, bread and burn reactor, like a candle, that you have a, a, a kind of a coupling between the fissile and fertile. I have a picture to show you. And this came into fashion, that bread and burn is going to solve every problem of the world. I disagree there. The point is that bread and burn, what is bread and burn? Bread and burn has fast reactors, which are specially designed to breed plutonium from depleted uranium and fission significant fraction of the bread plutonium without reprocessing. This is an approach that you don't want to do reprocessing. Still, you want to do some breeding. You want to take care of your stored uh, um, spent fuel inventory, which has a large uh, fissile, and particularly plutonium. So how it is done? It is like a candle system. You have a breeding region. You have a fresh fuel depleted, and this is the burning region. So the breeding region gradually moves. We are all familiar with candle or incense stick. The concept is similar to that. A traveling wave, that's, the traveling wave did not uh, uh, gain much importance. Later, it came the standing wave. So you move the core. You have the discharge core from here. And more and more material from the fertile is going inside, getting bred, and finally being burnt. And this is depleted uranium again, is loaded from the other side. So this fuel moving while the power distribution profile is steady, fertile material converting to fissile and brought to the burning zone. And finally, the outer fuel zone such stuff or more continuously uh, to, to put more of uh, the fertile inside. Again, I don't want to take much time on molten salt reactors because this is something which is very promising. Molten salt of lithium fluoride, beryllium, but it's, but it's not fixed. You can have different kinds of fluorides, even people consider even chlorides. Enhance safety due to large difference in the melting point and boiling point. Whenever a reactor designer works on it, he tries to see what's the thermal margin. Operating temperature, and to what temperature, if there's a thermal spike, there'll be no serious damage. And you find that the thermal margin here is very large. Very high thermal efficiency, obviously, because you're operating at a temperature close to 850, 900 degrees Celsius. Online removal of poison and fertile. This is one of the most important points in MSR. That is, you can remove the poison, and you can feed on continuously more of fissile. Advantage is that, Never, the reactivity of the whole system is very large. And you're not killing the reactivity by pushing some absorber material inside, which is a loss of neutron. Here, the loss of neutron is not there. So you are actually gaining a neutron economy very significantly. And that is the reason why one can do very close to, I mean, you can actually have a breeder in thermal region. I'll explain to you that. And there's a other possibilities because there's nothing like a meltdown process. It's already molten. What else it can do? What is the radiation damage in liquid? No radiation damage. On the fuel itself. Of course, you have structural material, and you have to be concerned about it. And the passive dumping is also possible. It's like a huge tank in which all molten salt is there, and you have some what's called freeze valve, frozen plugs, which automatically melts without any interference, and it will allow all that to drain out the moment there is a thermal fluctuation or thermal uh, uh, increase, temperature increase. So this has the advantages, but you have to have a basically, a, a reprocessing online. And without reprocessing online, this is the, this is the uh, sort of heat transfer. This is the reprocessing line. In the reprocessing online, if you don't have, the real advantage of MSR is lost. So what is this advantage? I told you about this protactinium problem. Main problem is that protactinium, if you can take out this process, this is a reactor from where we are all that fuel, which itself is a coolant, takes out the heat and finally deposits it. Sorry, this is the reactor. And uh, this reactor, I think I should show that. This, is, this side is the heat exchanger. The molten salt finally deposits the energy here, comes back here. And this side is a reprocessing. These two are coupled. So here I'm only talking of the reprocessing part. This is the reactor. From the reactor, the molten salt comes, and we are doing the reprocessing process. Reprocessing allows the fission product to come out, so poisons are removed, and protactinium is also brought out. Reason for protactinium to be brought out is that you're not exposing this protactinium to neutrons. And if protactinium are not seeing the neutrons, they'll decay, and the decay period is very short. I'll explain that. And then finally, you can have some additional fuel coming over here, and you can continuously add that. You can have a two-fluid system where the fertile and fissile are again separated by a mechanical barrier made out of graphite. 
So this is the sequence of that protactinium problem. Thorium 232, thorium 232 can go to 233, and if you allow that beta decay, it comes to protactinium. So one channel is that this protactinium, if it, if it is, gets a neutron, can become protactinium 234. So this line will operate. If it does not, then it decays to uranium 233, becomes a fuel. So what you should do is that this protactinium should not be seeing these neutrons. That is most important. And that is done, what I shown in the previous picture, that this protactinium is keeping there, and you keep it for 27 days, 27 days is a half-life, little longer than that, and protactinium will be free of uranium-232 because that line is not opening up at all. There are some drawbacks, drawbacks of dimensional changes in the structural material like graphite, frequent replacement, zirconium hydride can be considered. There are issues on this. Tritium control is needed because tritium is produced from the lithium side, so lithium as a fluoride may not be the best, suit, best option. Better structural materials to hold past alloy N is developed. Further development may be necessary. Bilayer material can be more effective. Radioactivity in primary circuit needs retention, cooling under all situations. Now come to the requirement of fuel and reprocessing capacity for different reactor systems. Just now I explained to you all these. If you take into that, that PHWR, PHWR with enriched uranium and thorium, advanced heavy water reactor, or a light water reactor. In a PHWR, burn up is 7,200. In a PHWR which uses 235 enrichment of 3% in thorium, can go to, by, by physics calculation, can go to 60,000 megawatt day per ton. What's the advantage? The big advantage is, here you have to reprocess fuel, the reprocessing quantity will be 170 ton per year, and here that will get reduced to 20 ton per year. So this is a very big advantage if you get a high burn up, which is also true for HWR. There is a price to be paid. What's the price? Price is here you produce about 600 kg of plutonium. Here you'll be producing 210 kg of plutonium. So there's a significant reduction in the plutonium production in this. So now look at the scenario in India. In India, we have to multiply our capacity. And that multiplication of the capacity is possible only when we build more fast reactors. And for more fast reactors, we need more plutonium. So for us to directly go into this, may have some difficulty unless we get uranium from outside. Let me now compare that why thermal breeder is attractive. This is the present day our, our sequence, pressurized heavy water reactor. Again, I'm talking of one gigawatt electric generation. So 170 ton natural uranium is required per year. Obviously, one, uh, nearly 170 ton per year of the spent fuel comes out. It goes to the reprocessing plant. We get 600 kg of plutonium. It goes to the fabrication plant, fast breeder reactor, it operates. It again produces one gigawatt electric, reprocess, that fuel goes back. It's... But for a fast breeder reactor, the requirement, the initial requirement for one gigawatt electric is four ton of fissile, four ton. Compare that with molten salt reactor with one ton fissile. Molten salt reactor can, the same power can come from one ton fissile material. That's the advantage. And if you do that, then you see, start with this, you require a little less natural uranium compared to that when you have an enrichment plant. Then PHWR with enriched uranium, you go for the reprocessing. You are getting much less uh, to 233 plus thorium per year and, and 20 ton per year of the spent fuel is much less. So reprocessing volume is much reduced. And you go to MSBR with a breeding ratio of about 1.05. Here you can get 1.2. Today our PABR will not get this value. PABR will perhaps be about 40 years is our doubling time. But here the breeding ratio is 1.2. MSBR can give you breeding ratio of 1.05. But there's a significant difference of what is the inventory that you require for starting a new reactor. Here is one ton, here is four ton. And that makes all the difference. Doubling time in both these cases are same, that is 22 years. So thermal breeding is a, not only the possibility, thermal breeding can actually compete with the fast breeder reactor breeding. Accelerator-driven system, again, there's no need for expanding it more. This has been very nicely discussed by several people. You know, again, I was telling you that basically the problem of neutrons. Fertile material is plenty in the world. We have to convert that fertile to fissile. Who gives you that? It's only the neutron. Neutron is the fission only process of getting neutron? No. There are other processes like spallation. 
And spallation, you can see, one GeV proton can give you as much as 20 neutron per proton or 40 neutron in case of a uranium as a target. So you get a copious number of neutron by other means. So if you can really develop ADS as well, no doubt that one day we'll be able to convert all that fertile into fissile. And then the energy reserve that we have in terms of fission nuclear energy, I'm not talking of fusion, purely fission nuclear energy is really adequate for fulfilling some of the dreams of Bhabha, of Lewis, and many others who had dreamt long, long time back, 60 years back. So self-sustaining thorium cycle in a subcritical reactor, you can see that if we are using a thorium, uranium oxide as in the two outer rings in MOX, again, I'm taking a PHWR example. It is possible that you, the, 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 the buildup of the fissile will make it that you don't really require any more fissile to be entered. It will be all bred in situ. So Indian three-stage nuclear program has been discussed a number of times. I don't have to, but you know that the reasoning or the rationale behind it is that you, you generate power, you generate some plutonium. With that plutonium and with that convenient doubling time, you can keep on building up the inventory of plutonium as well as uranium-233. Excess neutrons are available. Those excess neutrons are converting thorium to 233, and that becomes the fuel for the third stage. And you can really get, when we had a reserve of only 10,000 megawatt kind of a capacity with our own uranium, then this was written, that this, this is the total energy that comes out, 300 gigawatt electric, which gets multiplied. Today we find that it's possible to get uranium from outside, and then this multiplication can be even more. Now I'm only adding a few things for consideration. One is that it's very attractive to consider development of MSR with online reprocessing with the objective of achieving doubling time comparable to that of us reactors. If that is achieved, this may expedite tapping nuclear energy from thorium and allow the growth of nuclear power capacity as desired. It can be a parallel line by which I'm not saying that we have to discard the fast reactor line because that is a technology which has been brought to a size. We know that it's working. And so that we must continue. But it is now very good to consider that we should also try MSR and see that that can also match the same kind of a doubling time, that of the fast reactor. This may expedite tapping, yes, and this will not only the nuclear energy from thorium and allow the growth of the power as desired. Finally, I am also talking of that is it not possible that thorium low enriched uranium MOX in PHWR can go for a massive application right away because this technology is 100% proved. So it will allow building of inventory of U-233. It will also open up the opportunity for PHWR export because there is a thinking that thorium-based reactors worldwide, they feel that there's a better safety system and other things. And PHWR is also, in a way, has also proved its safety, safety features very well. So it's possible that, and this is a smallest size, Dr. Kakotkar emphasized that point. PHWR of 220 megawatt capacity has proven to be the smallest size of a commercially competitive reactor. A 220 megawatt reactor can compete with a 1,000 or 1,500 megawatt reactor elsewhere. So commercially, 220 megawatt actually has that competition. And in that, if it is possible to put thorium low enriched uranium, and which will be completely proliferation resistant, it can be accepted in many places in the world. And the spread of nuclear energy in many new countries where nuclear energy is not there would be possible by this. So use of thorium under, there are different scenarios. I just list out the scenarios. I think I have already exceeded my time. My chairman is very kind to me. So scenario A is the one that where there's a large inventory of ready to burn fissile material. Huge spent fuel. Problem of putting them in somewhere. Even Yucca Mountain is not taking them. So this is a large problem. Large nuclear generation capacity already exists. 100 gigawatt capacity is ex existing, or 60 or 80 gigawatt capacity is existing. There's no need for rapid growth. This is one kind of scenario. They will think of how to use thorium in one way. The other countries like that, we have a very modest fissile inventory, very large reserve of thorium, and there's a large requirement of a growth. This is another scenario. Third scenario is a country which is entering. They have a proliferation resistance. That's the first scenario where they can't reprocess. They can't easily get a, a fission, fissionable material from outside without any, any ties. 
but they can get something like that, which is completely proliferation resistant. And the fourth scenario is where you want to replace, you want to have a, already a plant there, maybe a thermal power station, and you want to place there a nuclear power station, but that requires safety level of much higher level, where there'll be no, region, no re reason for asking for an exclusion zone. Enhanced safety features and no high pressure containment. One of the main points in the molten salt reactor, again, it is true also for our fast, sodium cold fast reactor, there's no high pressure domain. If there's no high pressure, in fact, uh, many a time I debate with our mechanical engineers that for carrying enthalpy out, should you go to high pressure or high temperature? Being a metallurgist, I prefer high temperature. Mechanical engineers are married to the concept of James Watt. They think only high pressure is the way of carrying enthalpy. But enthalpy, as you know, has two terms, E plus PV. The PV part, if you, if you keep that P part low and in the, in, in, uh, the, the energy part more, that is in terms of thermal energy, then it is safer because there's no way it can, it can distribute or you don't need a pressure boundary. So that's an advantage. So all those advantages also can be seen in a molten salt or in some systems in which you are not really working at a very high pressure. So these are different scenarios and for, for everywhere you find that thorium has a major role to play. So what's the way forward? The biggest problem of thorium, you know, what is the problem? You all are sitting here. Thorium is considered for the future. At any point of time, you think it is for the future. So it will remain only in the future. The biggest problem of thorium to this August audience, I must tell that you have never considered thorium for the present. And unless you say that thorium is for today, there's no way thorium will remain in future. So first is a large number of options that are available today. The choice needs to be made appropriately to to enhance the installed capacity in short term and sustaining energy production in the long term. We must be emphatic in saying that the solution exists. It is for us to accept the solution. We are only thinking of solutions which don't exist. Even I would say, I'm, I'm a believer of fusion reactor, fusion systems, but I would say that fusion is not something really which is still for the future. But thorium-based reactors and that huge reserve of thorium in the world which can sustain the energy supply for the whole planet for thousands of years, we are neglecting that. And molten salt reactor is a very wonderful opportunity and we must uh, spend more time and more energy in developing this to come one day to say that it's also a technology as, as robust as maybe PWR. Thank you for your patience. Dear friends, <clears throat> you will uh, agree with me that uh, Dr. Banerjee gave really outstanding and very, very clear presentation with deep knowledge about the subject. He has lived with this subject. He has brought out strengths and also challenges. And what is most important is he has really put before us the action plan for us to implement. Thank you, Dr. Banerjee, very much. And let us give a big applause all over again. <laughs> I think I can take a couple of questions. So, yes, the first question. Hello. Yeah, after the Thank you for a very enlightening yeah. talk, sir. Uh, I have a question. Actually, uh, I understand from the all uh, that uh, past talks also and this talk also that uh, MSR is the basically uh, future uh, for these thorium based reactors now. Uh, uh, whether in our country we are going for this uh, 300 megawatt ASWR, which we uh, uh, feel that it is a demo reactor. So what is your opinion, sir, uh, whether we should go for with uh, this 300 megawatt uh, ASWR or it should be some small reactor uh, for demo purpose? Thank you, sir. This is not really pertaining to my presentation, but at the same time, I would say that we should not view like this. When Weinberg was doing that experiment at Oak Ridge in India, 
there has been uh, activity already started on molten salt reactor. This is the whole problem. It's kind of infectious. In uh, Oak Ridge, abandoned the project. It was abandoned worldwide. So this is not scientific. This attitude of ours anywhere in the world, I would say, is not scientific. If Weinberg has done that experiment, has done it successfully, there should not be, there may be a, there there's again a competition, whether you go for the liquid metal fast breeder reactor or the molten salt reactor. And in that you see that, yes, the breeding ratio that you get in the fast breeder reactor is better. So you drop. I don't know if this is correct, but I think Weinberg lost his job also. So it's like that. So, but this is not the right approach, scientific approach. Scientific approach should be that we should say advanced heavy water reactor has certain elements which are completely different. So when we talk of a passive features of the, of the safety, then it has its own merit. So there's no way that we can make a one-to-one. -one. What I'm trying to say is that, that molten salt research activity requires a tremendous amount of effort, again worldwide. And uh, if the commerce doesn't come in the top, and if the science and technology development is our primary aim, and literally we are thinking of the future of the planet, and where we are together, to say that yes, we have to make a <coughs> molten salt breeder reactor a reality, that should be given a focus. It is not a technology today that tomorrow you can install it. So obviously our present growth path with the uh, PHWRs, with light water reactors, with fast reactor will continue. There's no way you can come out of that. But at the same time, it is a necessity that we have to have an intense thrust on this. So we are 1.25 billion people. It's not a small number, no? Take a smallest of that small fraction. 0.01%, I was calculating that. Something like 1,25,000 people. If we say that we are we are committed to do this. Some part will do for the light water reactor development, some part will do for the uh, fast reactor development, and a small number, even if you, uh, if you have some few thousand people working on molten salt reactor and make it a reality, then it will be a reality. So it, what is lacking is determination, not anything else. <laughs> so it's determination excellent, is lacking. Excellent answer. I think rather than debating about numbers and the plan and etc. Let us do something that is very important. Yeah. Well, that's what I would like to discuss. Let us do something. As you know, in, during the early 1950s, there is a good rapport between USA and India, which are still two largest democracies in the world. I think we need to read, go back to that, make atoms for peace for everyone. Uh, there's a lot of plutonium sitting in the world that they want to get rid of it. There is a need here. So we need to create an atmosphere where that can be used. Similarly, there's a lot of spent fuel sitting out there. That can be used. But I think, as I presented, there is a technology that can be implemented now, which is called Torcon. Any? Yes? I also have a question. Um, it's about the protactinium. Uh, yes. So. I agree with you that from a breeder perspective and also from a neutronics perspective, it's a really nice uh, to get the protactinium out of the salt. Uh, but on the negative side, it's a proliferation problem. Uh, and I was wondering if you have some um, ideas to uh, uh, share whether how we as scientists should value one uh, against the other and how to find out should we really be allowed to take it out and is that a good idea or should we keep it in the salt or is that the best idea? See, you, you have answered it or, or, already. The answer to this is that, the, what is the aim of this? If aim is that we have to have a higher breeding, protactinium needs to be removed. Otherwise, there's no way that you can have a molten salt breeder reactor competing with that of a fast reactor. No way. Because that, uh, you can't change ETA by design. So the, if the purpose is very clear that we have to have a higher breeding, then this is the reason. The question is that if you want to really have some high gamma emitting isotope purposed into the fuel so that it cannot be diverted, and that's why you call it proliferation resistant, then you need to keep it. So you can have different designs of different things. But that is, again, you know, scientists have this problem. We actually ask, raise too many questions. 
and by raising too many questions we don't allow that something to develop can i kind of summarize so you say maybe in weapon states that are allowed to make fast breeders they can also make uh, they can take the pr uh, protactinium out but in some other states where we want more security they, they should keep it inside but i think if you take purely from the energy scenario the answer is clear if you are just taking the energy scenario protactinium is a protactinium actually causes too much of neutron uh, neutron loss too much yeah. in the system it's not one more than that so that's why taking out protactinium has a great advantage in terms of uh, of uh, gaining uh, in terms of the uh, breeding ratios okay Thank you. yeah uh, just last question, yeah. Thank you for your very inspiring and interesting lecture. We always enjoyed it as a, all your lectures as a big treat every time. Uh, my, uh, uh, there are two couple of points I want to make. In the case of fast reactors, the people have been struck with sodium as a coolant. And we all know from basic physics calculations, if you use a heavy metal, which doesn't moderate like lead bismuth or lead, uh, you have a negative white coefficient, undoubtedly, with thorium also. And with the eta being very high, you can go to very high breeding ratios, as high as 1.6. So I used to ask my friend and colleague, Dr. Chetel, who was in charge of the fast program, he says, Ganesh and you physicists people do a lot of calculations, but for each coolant, I have to spend 30 years to establish it as technologically viable. So calculations are easy. So that's one thing I would like to have your valued comments. The other point is that so what is people... The question, what is the question you said? The question is why we cannot speed up some of these things by going for more innovative fast reactor systems using lead as a coolant instead of talking about uh, uh, with, with the sodium because some of the numbers we have... No, no, lead, sodium to lead comparison comes from a completely different angle. That is not only that uh, from, the, uh, from the heavy or light point, main important point is that sodium is more reactive. Reactive with oxygen, reactive with water. Also, why so is possible? avoiding that, but lead also did not really, that this concept is all there, you know, in G4. They're considering all these kind of coolants. So it's that's, really that's, being discussed. I, I feel uh, that's one thing. Other thing yeah. is the fusion fission uh, breeder reactors for thorium utilization yes. also being discussed. Again, I, I forgot to, to yes. ADS. Good to point out that I told you the neutron source could be spallation, it could be fission. It can as well be fusion. With the sub loss and mode, you can Exactly. Do so the question is that if you can get more of neutrons coming out from other sources and somehow couple it with a reactor, it's good. Yeah. But the question is that that is a much bigger challenge in design yeah. compared to the MSBR. That's right. It's a rather simple design. It's yeah. not too complex. That's right. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, should we have further discussion together with coffee? Or maybe last question. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. I would like to add a dimension to your first question. How does it come that we don't do industry-wise thorium yet? And, well, as you know, I'm, I'm coming from industry in the past. I would like to add a dimension. It's a question of management of uncertainty. And what I mean management of uncertainty in the next 10 to 20 years globally in nuclear energy. If really nuclear energy has to deliver drinkable water, clean air, etc. we need a lot of nuclear energy. Now, 60 years down the road in uranium-plutonium fuel cycle, we have some uncertainties, being it fast reactors, you know. We have been building fast reactors in the 80s already, 30 years down the road. They are not yet industrialized as such, and it will probably still take 30 years before they will be really industrialized. So that brings uncertainties in management of the uranium-plutonium cycle. There, thorium could bring added value, added degrees of freedom in order to continue and complement the uranium-plutonium cycle with being it in CANDUS, PHWRs, or even in LWRs in the next 10, 20, probably maybe 30 years because you manage, you have another option next to an uncertain option, unfortunately, of fast tractors only. Have you, you have any, any, have you any specific question to have ask? Have you any view on this from the Indian perspective how you see the fast reactor plutonium route uncertainty versus the thorium, maybe thermal reactor route uncertainty? Uh, the answer to this, I'll try in a very brief way because you have raised a very wider issue. The main point is that you cannot jump into uranium-233 thorium fuel cycle. If you have a, imagine that God had given us some uranium-233 and it's a mineable material then uranium-233 thorium fuel cycle would have been very good. There's no question of touching uranium. But to reach there, 
you need to convert in a, so you can't come out of the uranium plutonium fuel cycle in the foreseeable future, not in 100 years. So uranium and plutonium will remain in the, in the nuclear activity all along till you come and you come out clean from that and start with pure uranium-233 thorium cycle. So it's, it's too future. I think investors don't wait for 100 years for getting their money back. So that's the reason. Thank you. Thank you. In uh, appreciation of the lecture, let me present a memento to Dr. Banerjee.